Well, good morning, and uh, I'm glad to ha- see all of you here at uh, BCC. And uh, if you look at the front of the program, uh, we usually have the sermon series on there, and in there it says, In Hot Pursuit. Well, In Hot Pursuit got kind of cold in my thinking, and so I decided on Monday that I just was not comfortable where the series was going coming up in the next three weeks and felt a lot like the, the series we had just done. And so I just really sensed God saying, hey, I want to do this a little bit different. And in the Spirit of God, I just had that sense. And so uh, I, I, I thought of the kind of conversations that I've had over the last little while with people, and I thought, you know what? I think we need to go in a little bit of a different direction for three weeks just based on some of those conversations. So we're starting this brand new series, and uh, it is called The Dragon's Den. No, it's not the TV show, but it, you, I borrowed the title from it. And the subtitle is How to Live in a Hostile Culture. Now, you might be wondering, are you talking about work? Are you talking about home? Are you talking about neighborhoods? Are you talking about parliament? What are you talking about? I could be talking about all of those things, actually. And you might be wondering where I'm going with this series, but to help us better understand, let me start by defining the word hostile, or at least giving some words that are synonymous. Words like ill will towards, antagonistic, intolerant, adverse, unfriendly, inhospitable, angry and attacking. And here's what I've noticed, and I have personally experienced myself, is that if you declare that you follow Jesus, if you set your values and the principles you live by on the teaching of Jesus and on biblical truth, if you are unwilling to compromise those values and that truth, and even if you share them with others openly and graciously and with as much love as you can, The reality is from time to time, you will experience a hostility from others towards you simply because you say, I follow Jesus. Some people will just simply just kind of distance themselves from you. Sometimes people will, uh, you know, they'll choose to ignore you or to exclude you in certain settings. And at other times, there will be open hostility. It's pretty much verbal, but you will feel the verbal heat that comes from that hostility. You know, you can say you believe in God in our culture, and nobody really raises an eyebrow, maybe a few people. But when you declare that you are a follower of Jesus and that you, it's a completely different story. And some of you know that's true. That's why you don't want to openly declare in any kind of conversation that you follow Jesus. That's why we keep silent. That's why we don't speak out at times, because we don't want the hostility and we don't want the conflict. Now, I need to say that some of the hostility that we receive as followers of Jesus are deserved. Because there are times where the church has lost its credibility because of the people who call themselves these followers of Jesus. I mean, we can, it's all over the newspapers and news feeds and wherever you read about news. But there is this, uh, we we read about these clergy uh, abuse scandals and how they got swept under the carpet. Or maybe it is because of the open hostility that some mean-spirited Christ followers have demonstrated towards the culture awful, brutal words that are written, that are said, that are putting on, you know, are putting on uh, boards on sticks when they protest. And we deserve some of the hostility because of some of that. Sometimes it's that strong tie. We don't have it so much in Canada, but in the U.S. between a certain political party and being a, a Christ follower, and they've tied those together, and that's created hostility. Sometimes it's just the media who has learned to point to all of the brokenness and the weakness and the stories that get some, you know, airplay where they, you know, show hostility towards Christ followers. You know, because many people in our culture have been wounded and hurt and jaded because of the way certain Christ followers have lived their lives. They've lived in brokenness, not dealt with the brokenness, and they've lived out their faith through their brokenness, and it has wounded others. 
I know this firsthand. I mean, there was a time in my life where I was, would have been glad to walk away from this institution called the church because of the way that Christ followers handled themselves. If you claim that you are a follower of Jesus, you will not always get a positive reaction, and more and more, it will be negative. I've experienced this firsthand, and I know many of you have. Maybe you've experienced in the marketplace like I have or in your neighborhood or social settings, or maybe it's when you're on a sports team or it can be just in a simple conversation at a party or when you're on an airplane. Sometimes you feel that. I just want to tell you right now, if you think it's difficult to be a Christ follower and to declare that in, our, in public, you ought to be a pastor. Like, really? You sit down and people say, and what do you do? I'll tell you, there are more times than enough, I thought, if I could come up with another creative way to disclose what I do, I would be happy. I've done that a few times. I was on a plane one time, and the woman next to me said, oh, so what do you do? I said, well, I'm a teacher. I'm a leader. I, handle, I look after a faith community. She said, you're a pastor. I said, <laughs> yeah, I am. I've been tried. But we all know how difficult it is, right? University students sitting in science class or philosophy class or psychology class or some, you know, ethics class. I mean, is it easy to be a Christ follower? What about high school? It's no easier to say you're a Christ follower in this culture. It isn't. Often we are targeted, Christ followers are targeted in this anti-Christian, post-Christian culture where people have become intolerant of Christians. We're often targeted by groups that want to move the moral line and to move it away from the values that God has given us to live by. And those values and those principles are life-giving, life-changing. They are healing. They are, they, they change us. And yet, those very same values are under attack. hundred years ago, it was easy to be a Christ follower in our culture because they followed a Judeo, Judeo-Christian worldview and uh, you know, laws and principles and practices and culture were very much ba- based on those same biblical values. So it was kind of easy. You didn't, it wasn't a lot of hostility, but we live in a culture now that has lost their moral compass and, 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 and the widely held values in areas of sexuality, money, ethics, morality, marriage, education, family, even media, they are directly contradictory now to the values and the principles that we want to live our lives as Christ followers. And this culture that we live in is individualistic and it's self-focused and there is no one single standard of truth. Truth is relative. Truth is situational. Whatever the situation is, that's where I'll find truth. Or truth is emotional. Whatever feels right to me, that's okay. This is the culture we live in where our values contradict. So how do we as Christ followers live in this culture? Well, there's like three options, or there's two options. Option number one is to become a separatist. Not the Quebec kind, a different kind of separatist. We want to isolate ourselves from the culture. We create this Christian subculture. We have our schools and we have our music and we have this and we have that. And we just hide in this bubble away from the culture and just kind of close the doors and and kind of hide out inside. We are sort of the Christian version of the Amish and we kind of just live to ourselves. Lots, that option is being practiced lots these days. The other option is to simply be a blender just to compromise everything we believe, every value that we hold to, every principle that we live by, just blend in, compromise, won't, nobody will know the difference. Here's what I've noticed. Communities of faith that are separatists are declining. Communities of faith that are blenders are declining. So those options don't really work. But what if there was a different option? Well, I believe there is one. Because in the culture that we live in, there is a hunger for spirituality. Often the church is not the choice for that, or the the ways of Jesus are not that, but there is a hunger. And I really believe that Jesus' way of life, his values and his principles is what makes life the best it possibly can be. And we need to be able to share this life-giving message in a culture that is hostile. So how do we do that? Well, it's not going to be a separatist. It's not a blender. The solution is actually quite simple. It's a simple solution. 
in a culture that is anti-Jesus, we need to respond to the culture just like Jesus. It's that simple. See, when Jesus was here, he lived in a hostile culture, but he excluded love and grace and compassion, humility. He didn't seem to be bothered by the critics and those who were strongly against him. He always responded with grace. Sometimes he kept silent. Sometimes he spoke. Sometimes he pushed back. Sometimes he did nothing. I love these. I, I love the way that Peter, one of Jesus' closest friends, writes. He says this: "For it is commendable if someone bears under the pain of unjust suffering because they're conscious of God." He says, "You know what? You're commended that if you are a follower of Jesus, conscious of God, if you suffer, hey, that's a good thing." How is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and enduring it? Some Christians have handled the culture the wrong way, and you know what? They, they haven't done it right. But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable for, for God. God's going, I'll give you a high five if you live this way. And then he says this, to this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sins and no deceit was found in his mouth. Listen to this rest. When they hurled insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. God will deal with it. It says he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross. Jesus died on the cross for us because he loved us, because he wanted to help us to find the freedom from the hold that sin had on us and from the things that we've done in the past. He did that on the cross so that we might die to sin, so that we don't have to suffer like that any longer. It says, by his wounds, and we're going to celebrate communion today, by his wounds, we have been healed. And so for the next three weeks, we want to deal with what is it like to live in a hostile culture. And we're going to use a narrative out of the Old Testament. An Old Testament story, it's got a man's name attached to it. He probably wrote most of it. His name is Daniel. And the book of Daniel is kind of broken up into two parts. The first six chapters are how do you deal with a hostile culture when your feet are to the fire? How do you deal with it? And then the second part of it is the future of God's people when a day, talking about a day when the hostility will end. We're just going to look at the first six chapters. So, let's get right into the first part of the story in Daniel 1. It says, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah. Now, there's some historical background. That's the name of the king, and he's the king of Judah. Israel was once one nation, but under the fourth king, there was a division, and to the south went the people, and they called that part Judah, and to the north was Israel. So we have this divided kingdom. So this is the king of the southern kingdom. And then it says Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. This is King Nebuchadnezzar. Babylon is modern-day Iraq. And if you think the leaders in Iraq are brutal today, this guy was far more brutal than any of them. And what he, he, he had taken over so much of the known world, Egypt, Assyria, and he now finally has conquered the nation that he dislikes the most, Israel and Judah. And, and it, it's just that, um, it's just, th this is a hostile environment. This is the hostile environment that you have these people who have these God-driven values now going to be occupied. Actually, they're going to be exiled and enslaved by a, 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 a culture that is completely the opposite. And we need to understand something, and there's this great principle, and it's right in the first six chapters. It says this, and the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hands. Whose hands? King Nebuchadnezzar. The Lord delivered, along with some of the articles of the temple. God let them deliver articles of the temple in a story we're not going to look at, but these articles in the temple are going to be used to point people back to God. And one of the things that is so important is that phrase, and the Lord delivered, because this is one of the key aspects of the book of Daniel, one of the key themes, and this is it. God is in control. Even in a hostile environment where we may wonder where God is and what God is up to, we need to understand that God is always in control. Sometimes it will make no sense, but I would rather believe that a God is in control than just life is random and there is no God that's overseeing what's going on. 
And you see this in spite of appearances in this story. We'll see some stories next week and the third week where you're kind of going, where is God in this? Why is God letting this happen? God has not lost control. God is completely in control. And uh, I mean, he's more powerful than a human king. God is in control. He, he provides the ability for people to prosper, even in a hostile environment. Some people say that can't happen. Yes, it can, because you can see it in this story. And then we see another example of this in that first chapter, verse 9. It says, now God had caused. See, God is in control, no matter how hostile the environment. God has the power. He still calls the shots. God can deliver a king. God can keep lions' mouths shut. He can keep people from being burned in a fire. He can give the ability to interpret dreams. He can even write on a wall. He is still in control even when it doesn't see that, seem that way. And we can find that in a difficult environment, wondering, God, why are you leaving me here? Why are you allowing this to happen? I'm feeling like I'm the target of people's hostility. Where are you? Here's the reality. He's right there. God is always there. God never leaves us. Never, ever He is always with us. He's a spirit. He's present no matter what we've done or whether we've pushed him aside and we're part of the hostile culture or whether we're followers of Jesus, his son, God is always with us and God is always in control. And we need that confidence in that reality that God is in control and trust in his presence is essential and knowing he's in control is an imperative, and that confidence is so critical. So we're going to look at story number one, and I would title this, When Compromise is Not an Option, because sometimes compromise is what we want to choose. I want us to look at today when it's not an option. So let's just dig uh, dig into the story. It says, Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of the court officials, to bring into the king's service, some of the Israelites from the royal family and nobility. So not only did he um, take treasure, not only did he take the people, but he took members of the royal family and nobility. So these these are a group of young men, and we're given their qualifications. It starts that they are noble which, and, or royal, which means that they were from the powerful, influential families of Israel. So that's who they are. And then we have this list of qualifications of what the king was looking for. Here's what it says. Young men without any physical defect. It means they're physically fit, strong men. They're handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning. They learn quickly. They're well-informed. means that they're well-educated in politics and religion and society. They're quick to understand. They can take concepts and they can understand them and they're able to come up with wise um, and and positive solutions. And it says, and they're qualified to serve in the king's palace. Um, and, 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 And that means that they had the etiquette. They had the manners to serve in the king's palace. I mean, listen to these qualifications. This is the cream of the crop, Right? They're smart, they're good-looking, they're physically fit, they're well-educated, they're wise, they're affluent, I know their pain, I get it, I can relate. Why are you laughing? I would say not. And what he was going to do is he was going to teach them the language and the literature of the Babylonians. Language and literature is a phrase that means he's going to teach them and indoctrinate them about the entire culture of the Babylonians. That's what he was going to do. It says in verse 5, the king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. The king's table, that would have been the best food and that would have been the best wine because what these group of men that were being selected these from the nation Israel, what they were going to do is they were going to eat what the king ate, they were going to drink the wine that the king drank. And this was going to be a three-year indoctrination. And then they were to enter the king's service. See, he wanted to indoctrinate them for three years. He wanted to immerse them in the culture. And then he wanted to send them back to Judah and other countries where they spoke the language to indoctrinate those who remained there. This was a strategy. This was his plan. 
He was going to indoctrinate them in, in literature and language and history and religion and philosophy and astrology and dream interpretation. That's what he was going to teach them. Go on to verse 6. Among those were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. That was their names. And names were important in that day. When parents named their kids, it wasn't just giving them the you know, trendy name of the day with some sort of spelling that's not like any other. <laughs> These names meant something, right? These names. Daniel means God is my judge. Hananiah means God is gracious. Mishael means God is great. And Azariah is God is my helper. So, we get these four young men. Now, here's what I noticed so far. They are immersed in the culture. They're being educated in that culture. They're being trained. They learn a new language, new skills, new ability, and, and everything religious, and there's no rebellion. We don't read them and said, and they said, no way, we're not doing this. They don't. They seem to embrace this. And there is a lesson to be learned, a big lesson, that in a hostile culture, in order to engage, there are things that we have to embrace about the culture. As long as those things don't violate the principles and the practices and the values that God has instilled in us, we are free to embrace those things of the culture. See, the separatists, they don't want to engage. They find everything bad and wrong and to be avoided, and they fight against the culture, and they're known for what they're against and not what they're for. And they write horrible blogs and horrible media pieces, and they throw rocks from their little spiritual bubble. But that only adds to the hostility. These guys seem to embrace that. They engage the culture See, all compromise to a culture is not wrong. In fact, it's beneficial to embrace that if you want to engage them. But we don't compromise our values. And the story goes on. It says, the chief official gave them new names. And Daniel's name was Belshazzar. And Hananiah's name became Shadrach. And Mishael became Meshach. And Azariah became Abednego. These four had their name changed. What do you notice when you read the story? They don't rebel against the name change. They could have, but the same thing is practiced. They have this principle of if you want to engage the culture, you have to embrace some of the culture. Jeremiah wrote to this same group of people. Look what he says. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those that I carried in exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. He's saying, same group of people. This is what he says. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what you produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. And then he goes on and seek the peace and the prosperity of the city in which I have carried you into exile. God's still in control. He says, this is the way you're to live. Pray the Lord for that city because if the city prospers, you prosper too. This is, this is truth about engagement. He says, you want to engage the culture, then live among them. Embrace those things except for the compromising of values and principles. Jesus knew his followers would wrestle with this. This is what he said. This is Jesus speaking. I remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I'm going to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. He's saying, they're going to be in the world. You've got to protect them, Father. He goes on. It's a prayer. I've given them your word, and the world has hated them. Just why? Because they follow you, and they follow me and your word. For they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of it. That's what the separatists would hope. But that you protect them from the evil one. That you protect them from the evil one. And then he adds this. They are not of this world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them. Keep them pure by your truth, because your word is truth. He says they need to engage 
by embracing but not compromising. This is something very important. This is an important principle. Let's go on with the story, verse 8. But Daniel resolved. The word resolved means he thought, he contemplated, he worked it all out and said, okay, what's the best solution? I'm not going to defile himself with the royal food and wine. He says, you know what? I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to eat, eat that food and drink that wine from the king's table. I'm not going to do it. And there's been lots of theories why did he push back on this? I mean, he allowed his name to be changed. He goes through all this education and all this training. No pushback. And now it's simply about food and wine. Why the pushback? Why the pushback? Well, the pushback is because of what this represents. I think it's the phrase, the king's table, that is what it's all about. You see, it was not um, about, you know, not following kosher a law when it comes to food because the wine would be fine. Wine was not prohibited under kosher law. It had nothing to do with food sacrificed to idols because all of the food there was sacrificed to idols, including the vegetables. And it wasn't um, anything to do with them being vegetarians. You can't get your insight because all they wanted to do is drink water and eat vegetables. I'm sure they lost weight doing that for sure. Um, and so we, we, we kind of move on here. You see, what was happening was this king's table idea. And when you sat at somebody's table in that culture, you know what that meant? When you sat at the table in that culture is that you agreed with their principles, you agreed with their values, you treated them with almost worship, especially if it was someone um, of a high position. And when you sat at their table, you embraced their values, their beliefs, and you thought, and you embraced what the person stands for. In that culture... If you ate with someone, you said, um, I'm with them. We're the same. We believe the same thing. To eat at the king's table would have meant them saying, yeah, we believe what the Babylonians believe. And that's where he draws the line. See, King Nebuchadnezzar next week was thought of as a god. In fact, he thought of himself as a god. And to eat in his presence would be an act of worship to that god. So he resists because he, you know, he just didn't want to compromise. We talked last week about the, the, the three key idols of our day, money, sex, and power. And the same thing could be saying, we have to be very careful that we don't eat at the table of those idols because it can be a table that we're drawn to. Story goes on. Uh, okay, uh, he talks about favor to Daniel. But the official told Daniel, I'm afraid of my Lord the King who has assigned you your food and drink. You know, if you look worse than the other men of your age because you've not eaten the right food, he's going to have my head. That is not a colloquial phrase. That's reality. He would have been put to death. Well, notice, notice what Daniel does. I, I love this. He comes up with a solution. He doesn't get angry. He doesn't get mad and says, well, we're not eating it anyway. He comes up with a solution. And it says this, Daniel then said to the guard whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Please test your servants for 10 days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. And he said, oh, sorry. At, at the end of the 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. So the guard took away their choice food and wine, and they were to drink, and he gave them vegetables and said, that's their new diet. But here's what they did. And this is so, so important. In order to engage this culture, they proved that God's way works. They didn't dig their heels in. They didn't resist. They didn't, you know, angrily respond. They basically said, hey, guess what? God's way works best. And I think that's how we have to live in a culture that can be hostile, is to show that God's way is the way of healing and restoration and fullness and goodness. We have to live that way. If we've been promised an abundant life, then we should live like it. If we believe that God is in control, even when it doesn't make sense, let's live by it. If we believe following Jesus can make us happier, give us more joy and peace, then let's show it. If we believe God works all things together for good, let's live it. If we believe that there is a life to come that is far better than the life lived here, then let's live by it. 
If we believe our values and principles lead to a better or the best life, then let's live by them. If we say we trust the promises of God, let's live like it. Showing God's way is better. I gotta tell you, one of the biggest issues that turns the, co- <clears throat> the culture hostile towards us is hypocrisy. We say one thing, we believe these things, we have these values, and then we just walk again, we live against them. I think one of the great strategies is to be consistent. It is so critical. Compromise. What we believe in, we will be critiqued. So in the few moments that I have left, I wanna talk about this idea of compromise. How do we do that? How do we engage? Well, it starts, if you don't want to compromise, and the first thing, if you're a Christ follower, you say, I love Jesus, and you're here this morning, this one's for you. If you're not, this one's not going to mean anything, so that's okay. I have some for you coming up. But the first thing you want to do is this. What do I, who do I want to please? That's the first question you got to ask. Who do I want to please? When it comes, I stand at the road, crossroads of compromise, and God's way and God's values and principles are on one side, and, 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 and compromising principles are on the other side. Who am I going to please? Which road am I going to take? The compromising principles, you compromise my principles and values, or am I going to walk this way according to what God wants me to, to do? What am I going to, you have to ask that question, who are we going to please? You've got three options. Number one, you can please other people, and this is often a often one option that is chosen that is driven by fear. Fear of rejection or not fitting in or fear of not being included or being thought as different or fear of conflict or fear of relationships ending or isolation or being alone. It is fear of how other people receives it. If I stand to God's value, how will others receive me? And it's that fear that I won't be accepted that drives me that way. That's why high school and college students cross moral lines. Parents have taught them those values, but they've crossed them. Why? Because they want out of fear to please other people. It's easier. The second one is this, myself. Could be pleasing myself, right? I mean, we all have these desires. We all have these appetites. We, we desire something. It's usually something more, like more drugs, more alcohol, more sex, more relationships, intimacy, power, money, pleasure, stuff, more of whatever that we hunger at. And these appetites lead to us considering compromise. They do. I mean, look at these young men. They were offered the best wine and the best steak and the best of all other foods. That's what they were offered. But they said, you know what? We're not going to give in. They had the hunger for it. They had the appetite for it. They had the desire for it. But they said, nope, we're not going to please ourselves. But this can have an amazing, powerful pull on us. These appetites can be overwhelming at times. They can be. So option is please other people, please myself, or please God. It's that simple. Do I want to please God and live by his values and his principles, or do I want to please others, or do I want to please myself? It really comes down to that. It says in 2 Corinthians 5, 9, we make it our goal to please him, to please God, whether we're at home in the body or away from it. In other words, while we're living, we're going to do it, and when we die, we're going to do it. We are going to please God. And when you stand at those crossroads, I'm here to tell you, willpower will not cut it. Self-determination will not cut it. The values, um, you know, these cultural values will have a pull on us. Thinking the right thoughts won't do it because we'll rationalize and justify a way if it's willpower and self-determination. It's really about pushing the pause button and asking the question, who am I going to please? Who am I going to to please. Now, for all of us, whether you're a Christ follower, you're still checking things out, wherever you are on that spiritual continuum, we all face compromise. We all do. We all feel tempted. It could be compulsive behaviors, moral lines, giving into addictions. It can be any of those things. We all feel it. So how do we deal with it? Well, here's some really simple practical principles. Number one, establish our values ahead of time. 
When you get at the crossroad, don't say, hmm, I should establish some values here. Because you won't. You'll, you'll give in. You need to establish them ahead of time. It is too late when you're at the crossroad. And these values, you know, it said these four men, that they were well-informed. It means they had established their values ahead of time. That's what we need to do. We need to say, okay, I'm putting the values I believe in place. I'm going to live them out ahead of time. That is critical, not just saying, here's what they are, but I'm living them out. I mean, I, I have values that are foundational on biblical principles. I've established certain values when it comes to sexuality and my marriage and how I earn, spend, and save money and ministry and other moral standards. Oh, I have felt the temptation. I have felt the pull of compromise. I, we all do. But I established these values ahead of time, and it's made it easier when I've come to that crossroad because I've established them and I've been living by them. And so the first thing is, you got to establish those values and principles ahead of time. Number two, know where you are vulnerable. Like, where, what are those appetites that you have? What do you crave the most? What do you hunger for? Not only knowing where you're vulnerable, but what triggers that? Because there's certain things in life that will trigger us and make what we desire and what we hunger for, it'll be more appealing and more alluring. And so we need to know what triggers it, but what are we hungry for? See, compromise does not happen in one big step. It happens in a series of small steps where we dabble a little more and a little more until the cravings become overwhelming and we cross a line. And here's the thing, I talk to so many people who cross lines and they'll say two things. One of them is, what was, that's the question, what was I thinking about? Because they look back and go, this should have never happened. And then they'll say, I'm filled with so much guilt and shame. And so we have to know where we're vulnerable. It kind of becomes this mental warning system. I'm vulnerable to this, and, and what's going on in my life now makes me more vulnerable, so I need to understand that. Thirdly, you got to rely on the strength of others. These guys were together. There was four of them. And they had this small community, and they stood together. We need others to stand with us. We really do. Small group of people. Maybe just one other person, but maybe a group bigger than that. Could be close friends, others who are dealing with the same cravings or appetites. Could be a sponsor in recovery or a member of a step group or could be myself or another church leader. It's just saying, when I feel vulnerable and when I feel tempted and when I could cross that line, who am I going to call? Who's going to strengthen me when I'm going to give in to compromise? The next one is this. Play the movie forward. You're probably going, what are you talking about? It is pushing the pause button when you come to that crossroad where you can compromise, and it is pushing the button long enough to say, if I do this, what is going to happen? What will be the consequences? In our minds, we've got to think about it. Actually, it works better if you think about it beforehand, thinking, if I ever cross this line, this is what is going to happen to me. And you know, we can look at the short-term consequences, but often we don't think enough about the long-term consequences. And the Bible is filled with stories about people who didn't think of the consequences, and they thought they'd be short-term, but they ended up being long-term. You think of David and Bathsheba. He sees this beautiful woman, and she's bathing below his window, and she's naked, and he's aroused, and he sends a servant, and, and, and his intention is to sleep with her. And as she's coming up to his room, could you imagine if someone had said, David, 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 don't do this. She's going to get pregnant, and you're going to cover it up, and you're going to get into a conspiracy to commit murder. And that child is going to die. And the ripple effects are going to affect the rest of your family. And there's going to be rebellion and rape and incest and murder among your kids. And you're going to be heartbroken. And you're going to leave a legacy. Your reputation will be soiled. And, 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 and people you love will change their opinion. If this should, somebody stepped in and said, David, don't do it. Play it forward. And what if they said, David, you know what? Hundreds of years from now. This guy, Matthew, is going to write a book, and he's going to start it with the genealogies of the Messiah, the coming one, the Savior. And when he comes, 
you know, when he comes, he's going to put a list of all of the people who are in the line of the Messiah, and you're in that line. But he's not going to say, David, the wonderful king of Israel. He's going to say, David, whose son was Solomon, whose mother was, you know, the woman that David had this affair with. All through history, David is going to be known for this. If he had played it forward and someone had been there, I think things would have been different. So what about you? Do you have that discipline to push the pause button and say, whoa, whoa, whoa. This could have short-term and long-term consequences. Sometimes you've got to think about them ahead of time. Next, just be humble. Just be humble. I love this verse. If you think you're standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. You know, in other words, it's the person who gets to the, the, the crossroads. And you know what they say? No problem. I can handle it. It won't hurt me at all. I will never give in. It'll never happen to me. I'm telling you, those words are the words of when somebody tells me that, I go, boy, I'll be picking up the pieces if they come back to me. Because when they say that, it's a pride and like we can handle it and we case this. you got to be humble. And then lastly, just let the Holy Spirit be your conscience. Just say, Holy Spirit, live in me. And I want you, every time I'm ready to cross the line, to slap me on the back of the head with a two-by-four covered in velvet and remind me, <laughs> remind me of all of these things. Remind me of who I'm going to please. Remind me of your teaching. Remind me of your values. Remind me of the consequences. Convict me. Make my guts churn when I think I'm going to give in. Because all of us are going to stand at a crossroads where compromise is going to be an option. The question is, who are you going to please? Somebody else? Yourself or God? God is watching God is all-knowing. God is present. God will not let you compromise forever. He will not. He loves you too much to let you ruin your life through compromise. And he will step in. And sometimes the stepping in is painful. It says this at the last part of this first chapter. It says this. These four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. At the end of the time set by the king to bring them into service, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. Look at this. The king talked with them, and he found none equal to these four guys. So they entered the king's service. In every matter of wisdom and understanding of which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than all of the magicians. They're not guys who are doing card tricks. These are sort of people who give wisdom with astrology and so on. The magicians and the enchanters in his whole kingdom. Do you get how this worked? They didn't compromise. Look what God did. Look what God did. He blessed their lives in an incredible way, and he will bless our lives as well. Imagine what will happen if you choose to compromise. Also imagine what could the good that will happen if you choose not to. Just imagine living your life in such a way that though those in the culture are hostile towards you, they will look at you and say, what, however they're living, I, I don't like it, I don't agree with it, but it's really working. And maybe they'll just say, I wonder what's going on with them. And maybe they'll ask themselves the question, I wonder if it's God. Let's pray. And so, Father, I just, it is sometimes so hard and so challenging to live in a hostile world that just tempts us at every turn. May we find strength and courage and power not to compromise. May we desire to please you. Remind us of the consequences of crossing those lines. Somebody here today, I just have a sense, is ready to cross the line. May they understand the consequences. May they understand how it'll play out. And may they choose to Grab hold of a friend today and say, listen, I'm struggling. And may that friend help them to stay strong. Lord, all of us are vulnerable. All of us are tempted. 
May we find our strength and our power to stand against those things through your power. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.